I'm Russell Beard in eastern Kenya where farming communities are using an ancient technology to combat climate change and access rainwater even in the dry season. I'm Juliana Schatz in eastern Kentucky where a grassroots organization sees mountaintop mining as a green opportunity. And I'm Sylvia Rowley in the heart of London with a group of volunteers who see opportunity where others see junk. Forty percent of the Earth's land surface is classed as dry land that's characterized by long periods of drought and short periods of very intense rainfall. These dry lands are home to one in three people on the planet, most of whom live in developing countries where the constant search for water traps millions in a vicious cycle of subsistence. I'm Russell Beard in eastern Kenya, where an organization is helping local communities mitigate the effects of climate change by improving soil health and food security and repairing endangered ecosystems. In many places, overgrazing and deforestation have reduced the land's capacity to absorb rainwater, so that when it does fall, more than 50% can be lost as runoff, taking valuable topsoil with it and turning fertile farmland into desert. Joe Kiyoko and his colleagues at the Africa Sandam Foundation are determined to help communities across Africa break the cycle of poverty and drought with an ancient rainwater harvesting technology called a sandam. Okay, Joe, so yeah. I can see there's some activity going on down here. Yeah, this is where the action is. This is amazing. The raw materials are bought with donor funding, but the manpower is all voluntary. A sand dam is a reinforced concrete wall built across a seasonal riverbed. Over three or four rainy seasons, sand is washed downstream and deposited in the reservoir behind the dam wall, which stores up to 40% of its volume as water. The sand slows evaporation, filters the water, and protects it from contamination by livestock or disease-carrying mosquitoes. And because the water table is raised, the entire ecosystem surrounding the dam regenerates naturally. How do you build a sand dam? You make the form work using timber, then you just mix cement and sand and water, then you keep on adding rocks. You keep on adding rocks as well as the reinforcement bars held in place by the barbed wire. Yeah. Well, should we go down? Let's go down. How many gallons of water do you think the sand dam will collect? It will be millions of litres of water. Millions of litres, Millions right. of litres of water. So then they just come fetch water and go home. But, uh, mostly it was girls and women who are doing yeah. it. And that explains why there are more women than men here, because it is the women who are charged with the responsibility of collecting water. It's a nice atmosphere, isn't it? Everyone is volunteering, they're all getting stuck in. This, this is genuine community work. There's also a proverb in Kamba that says that uh, cha kimweke yo and it means one finger cannot kill lice. So for you to kill lice, you need two fingers so that you can press it. And that explains why the people are here to join hands to make this hard work light. Cha kimweke yo anda. Many hands make light work. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for letting me uh, for letting me take part. Everybody contributing in their own small way, and the world keeps on building, keeps on building. Joe wanted to take us to a mature dam to show us how it's transforming the environment. We are working on water, so to speak. <laughs> Look at this. You can see what an incredible, stark difference it is. It's just arid, sandy, just dry ground. And there it's just lush green. The animals are grazing, the trees are green. Yeah. It's unreal. So this, these pools of water here, these are actually from last year's rains. Yeah, because these acts as a reservoir, uh -huh. then it keeps on seeping down slowly, 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 up until they get to the next rain season. Yeah. And this is essentially what a sand dam does, holding water and then allowing it to flow downstream. 
alongside getting water for these communities, then the microclimate also gets changed positively, such that people and animals enjoy their, their surroundings. You're oasis makers, aren't you? Exactly. I would say we are oasis makers because if you manage to get something as green as this in the middle of a very hot and dry place, then that too would be called oasis makers. So just tell us what's going on here, Joe, because they, um, the ladies are obviously collecting quite a lot of water here. Yeah, yeah, this is actually a scoop well. It is different in color from the water held upstream. It is very clean, it has mm. been filtered. From here, they just go and use it straight in their homestead. They say this is the best that they have wow. at the moment. And if I can just taste it, um, pure. No salt, no nothing. Wow. Very natural, very fresh. Am I going to... Will I get sick if I try that? You can't get sick, it's sweet. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. All right, let's try it. Very clean. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Tastes better than yeah. the mineral well, well, water that we have in the, that yeah. have in the, in the car, right? Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. A moderate-sized dam can supply over a thousand people with a reliable source of water suitable for domestic use and even commercial agriculture. So this is a young farm, so the same age as the, as the dam. Brand new, as you can see. Yeah, brand new. Yeah. Oh, look at this. You can see the, uh, you can see these new plantations here. Is that kale and spinach? That is kale, spinach, some fruit trees in there. Uh -huh. There's some pepper, some maize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is your farm here, you share with your friends, but tell us, what was it like before, before you had the sand dam, what was it like when the rains would come? Oh, rain used to sweep everything. When it rained, water used to pass here, sweeping everything, going to Indian Ocean. Ah. Yeah. 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 So now when it was constructed, now there is a change on the environment. Even you can see, across there, there was no vegetation, green vegetation. Now you can see vegetation is still there. Mm -hmm. So with all this water, it means you must be working even harder, eh? Harder, yeah. <laughs> and you don't yeah. mind? You don't I don't mind. mind all this I work don't mind. I was even, this extra even water? no, I don't mind. Uh, you need to work hard to get your daily bread, because I'm not employed by anybody. I'm not employed. I have, I have employed myself here. That is what gives me satisfaction in this kind of work. You see people starting to earn them an income without destroying the environment. That's why we say sand dams transform lives. It's dams, 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 trees, 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 and the environmental benefits just fall in place naturally. Yeah. The Appalachian Mountains are known for three things. Forested mountains, bluegrass music, and coal mining. Since the 1970s, a controversial coal mining practice known as mountaintop removal spread across the Appalachian region of the United States. Using explosives, mountaintops are blasted away to expose coal seams flattening peaks into gray circles of arid land, destroying the water supply and terrain for plants and wildlife. I'm Juliana Schatz in eastern Kentucky, where a grassroots organization is revitalizing these highland habitats. For 14 years, Susan Lapis has been giving free plane rides to those who want to see the scale of mountaintop removal. Look at that. We already see a little bit over there, that former mining site. Yeah. I think these are all active Oh, these sites. are still active sites. Oh, yeah, no. Every once in a while, there'll be a big afternoon blast. There's such a contrast here. It's, there's these beautiful, dense forests, and then moonscape, like land. No, we could fly over all of Kentucky and over all of southern West Virginia until we ran out of gas four hours from now. 
Susan flies everyone, from politicians to celebrities, but often it's local miners who get emotional during flights. They don't like to see their homeland blasted to bits, but at the same time, it's the old jobs versus the environment argument where it's big money for Kentucky. Forestry professor Chris Barton runs Green Forest Works, an organization that hopes to reforest all the old mine sites. No, this is representative of a pretty typical large surface mine uh, that we would find in eastern Kentucky. This is what mountaintop removal is. I mean, this is still an active site. I mean, we've just heard an explosion. They're still actively hauling off coal. Under the 1977 Reclamation Act, when companies finish mining, they are only obliged to reshape the blown up mountains to prevent rock slides and then seed them with grass. However, the conventional reshaping process packs the soil so tightly that it resembles concrete. Dr. Barton aims to change this practice. Otherwise, it would take hundreds of years for trees or any other life to return. It's pretty barren here. I mean, how is this sustain any vegetation? That's where we have to interject to figure out ways that we can sort of mitigate the compaction that's associated with this land, how we can alter the soils so that a forest can actually regrow on this site. Mountaintop removal affects nearly 1.5 million acres of the Appalachian region. It would take about a billion trees to replant an area so vast. The first and most important step is seed harvesting. Ninth generation Appalachian, Nathan Hall, oversees this part of the project. It's amazing how well these trees will do on land that's been ripped up because basically they just need a good seedbed to get their roots down into. What may look inhospitable to us is actually really good for trees because you have rocks that are decomposing so there's a lot of minerals that are available to them. And a lot of these trees are actually adapted to sites that have been disturbed. These aren't any old seedlings. Nathan chooses them for their specific role in reforestation, called pioneer species, because they are the first plants on a site, adding organic matter and nitrogen to the soil and beginning the ecological recovery. So I wanted to bring you to a brand new, fresh reforestation site. We just got Jimbo, our dozer contractor over here oh, about I see two him. days ago. Oh, I see him. He's out ago. there in the distance. Yeah, yeah, he's ripping up about 30 acres of mountaintop removal mine land. He's got a big D8 sized dozer with a four foot ripper shank on the back. And it's just ripper a, shank. it's like a giant steel claw that just sinks into the ground and busts everything up. So the so tree roots. ripping up all that concrete like yep. compacted land. Okay. It's Jimbo Hamilton's job to till the soil so that the seedlings can break through. Hey guys. Hey Jimbo, how are you? Just fine. Can I come up? Yes nice ma'am. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How long have you lived in this area? I've lived in this area for 47 years. Is that how old you are? That's how old I am. And uh, so I've been around the surface mining industry as far as during the days of the late 60s, early 70s, all the way to the Reclamation Act to where all this right here started coming into play. Wow. So I've seen it change faces three different times. So Jimbo, can you give me a sense of what this place used to look like before surface mining when you were a kid? The terrain is very steep, and it was full of just giant timbers. And then when you get to the, when you got to the top, it's just giant rock cliffs. It provided a lot at that time, but still, it's very hard to work. Uh, we're just now getting started, so we've got a lot of work to do. So we should get to it. So we should get to it. Okay. <laughs> Without Jimbo's help, only about 10% of the trees planted here would survive. Tree in front of us, does that matter? This specimen don't, it's an alamata, which is an unwelcome specimen of this region. Right. So we take those out. We're doze just it over. doze it over. So the naked out, we're just tearing up, ripping up some land, but what's the greater ecological importance of what you're doing? We're improving the land that once upon a time was very fertile ground. Then after we had surface mined everything, the ground is not that good of quality. So now, not only are we improving the quality of the land, but the environment for humanity as well. 
The first time this whole process was performed 16 years ago, Dr. Barton doubted it would work. Dr. Gray's actually set up this experiment, but I was out here with a class that I was teaching, and we looked at it right after they planted it, and I was like, these trees don't have a chance. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because it looked so, it was like a moonscape. Then they planted these poor little trees in, and I didn't think there was a way that they would succeed. And every year since then, I've been back, and look at it now. It's just unbelievable that this has turned into a productive forest. The experimental forest is just beginning to demonstrate its full potential. Just an hour away, Robinson Forest, which used to be a bleak logging site, shows what true reforestation can look like 100 years down the road. This area is actually surrounded by coal mines, but one of the interesting things that this site provides is sort of a, a reference to what these areas may have looked like prior to the mining. So this is kind of like your control in an experiment. Exactly, so if we could bring it back to conditions like this, both with regards to the trees, with regards to the water chemistry, with regards even to the bugs that live in those streams, that would be our ideal goal for any type of restoration or reclamation project we're working on. When a site is fully reforested, the entire ecosystem is revitalized. The water, the vegetation, and the wildlife. Essentially, Dr. Barton's team provides the template and nature fills in the rest. I've had guys that I've worked with said, you know, hi, you're going green just like the rest of the world, you know. But people need to quit drawing a line in the sand. Get rid of the lines in the sand, come together, figure out what's best for our future generations. In the world's biggest economies, the way we use materials is hugely wasteful. Every time something ends up in landfill, we're losing not only valuable resources, but also the energy it took to make that product in the first place. To move away from this take, make, dump economy towards something that's more sustainable, we need people with the will and the skills to make it happen. So, Rebecca, this is the Brixton Remakery. It is. What is a remakery? Uh, it's a kind of unique concept that we've come up with, which is a space for making things out of waste materials, creating a load of workshops so that people can reuse and make new things out of any materials, so whether it's carpentry, bikes, IT, metal work. Um, but also we are using remake in its kind of broader sense, remaking people, so teaching them new skills and helping them change their life for the better. So this is our sort of Aladdin's cave of materials and almost everything in here would have been chucked away to landfill and we've rescued through one means or another to be able to use on the site. Wow. So we've got paint, wood, a load of doors again from a refurbishment I and mean, some of those doors are just really good solid quality doors and you know they would have ended up in landfill. Yeah. When you think about all the the water that went into that tree growing, the carbon that the tree would have been storing, it's such a waste if that wood ends up in landfill. Because yeah, I mean, it's all perfectly usable. You just need to have the right reason to use it. Wow, you've got loads of pianos here. Are they in tune? Uh, probably not, I think. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> The Remakery aims to create a series of workshops where people can work with metal, wood, fabric and electronics. We hope to reuse about 200 tonnes of material a year here. When you put loads of different people together and all these skills emerge that people didn't know they had or um, places emerge like this place that didn't exist before. So it's a kind of just putting a spark in uh, like with a fire and then loads of stuff can come out of it. But their first job is to remake the space. The UK construction and demolition industries create 120 million tonnes of waste every year, much of which could be reused. I've definitely never used one of these before. Even a water-damaged gym floor, once destined for a skip, can find new life as wall cladding. 
part of the ethos here is to make the most not only of neglected materials, but also neglected people. I was homeless and stuff before I found out about this project and um, all my tools were stolen and I, I was really, you know, down on my luck. My normal sort of life would be sort of, you know, maybe go down in the shops, get a beer in the morning and hang about in a park and then meet up with like-minded people and, you know, the, the rest of the day is not going to go well, you know. But, um, you know, here things are very different, you know, and I, 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 I go home at night and I get in the bath and I feel like I've really accomplished something, you know, and I've done something constructive. <laughs> different things going on it's a massive job to coordinate everyone and there's a guy called Winford who I've heard is the one who keeps everyone in line. Winford is so dedicated he's come in today even though his wife thinks he's still in bed with the flu. He manages the community payback team who are sent here by the probation service. Somebody has to be responsible for them. I've been here since January full time. This small section was done by some boys from Brixton prison. As different parts of the community come in contact with the remakery, more people begin to see the opportunity in waste. We've got lots of people who get involved with us, even though they can be apprehensive at first. Once two or three visits, place just grab all of them and they become like a part of us. Since it began 12 months ago, hundreds of people have given thousands of hours of their time. Brixton People's Kitchen. So what is the Brixton People's Kitchen? Wow, well, we collect surplus food from kind of stores around the borough and bring that together and cook it up all up and then we sit down and eat it together. So it's all about reducing food waste and it's getting quite nice. together. Yeah. Giving it a thumbs up. <laughs> Cycling around the area on a refurbished bike turned mobile restaurant. The Brixton People's Kitchen is one of the organisations that's benefiting from the remakery. It's a really good partnership. The bikes were built here at the remakery and of course both projects use the ethos of, of recycling and, um, and using waste. So We don't have all the recycled materials at our disposal but that's exactly what the remakery does have so that's just, it's just been totally awesome to have that come together. Every time you look in one of these there's something else going on. I think we've got some windows turning into doors. The remakery has been kick-started with grant funding, but soon people like Nicola will pay monthly to use the space, and the remakery will be run as a social business. Wow, I asked a load of builders whether they recycle piles, and they said no, they just throw them away if they're broken, so I thought I'd just make some money out of them. So you get the tiles, break them up, and then um, I'm left with something like this, which I paint, and then smooth it out to make this. Oh, look at that. I sell these ones for five pounds, this one for 10 pounds. My workshop was my front room, so I definitely will be using this space. I hope to change people's perceptions of um, how they view products you're actually making money out of rubbish, really, kind of thing. In this economic climate, it's not such a bad idea. <laughs> From bike repair to textile upcycling to furniture refurbishing, around 100 small businesses hope to use these workshops. And the model they're pioneering could form the basis of a new national network that transforms the way we use materials. If we share our resources, I think it's amazing how what progress can be made and what, what, what you know, how um, that can push communities forward, you know. It sounds fantastical to say that we have these nets that collect the water from the sky and then we use it to, to plant in our fields. Así como estamos acá, se sembrarían todos ellos, se vería pues verde. 